Hey everybody, this is DJ and welcome to Architects of Imagination. Um, it is my great pleasure today to uh, introduce someone who I miss, who I haven't hung out with in, in a while. Uh, this is Mohammed Alavi, who I know just as Mo. Uh, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? Very, very good. Um, so we worked together back on Modern Warfare 2. Uh, yeah. A pretty legendary time, a pretty legendary game. You were there for, I believe, all of Modern Warfare 1 as well. Yeah. Um, went on to be one of the founding members of Respawn Entertainment. Correct. Um, where you worked on Re uh, Titanfall 1 and 2, and eventually were one of the drivers behind Apex Legends. Right. Um, fucking legendary career. <laughs> well <done. laughs> Uh, you have since left now and and are uh, again uh, newly again a founding member of a relatively new studio which you guys can't talk about what you're doing but just give us a little intro uh and yeah tell us tell us the name of the new place and and what yeah. you guys are up to yeah so it's called wild light entertainment and we're working on a shooter and we're currently prototyping in unreal 5. uh can't really say much more than that uh other than the fact that it's basically a lot of the same designers and devs from Modern Warfare 2 era through Titanfall and Apex era. Yeah, look, looking at the uh, the roster, I recognized uh, a few names. We've got Grenier yeah. in there. We've got uh, <laughs> McCord, a couple, couple of the other yeah. uh, old timers. I worked with oh, yeah. Chad and McCord for 20 and 15 years, respectively. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, and you are probably uh, one of my favorite designers in the world. You have done. Oh. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Don't stop. Not, not just personally, but for your work, you've done some of like, there aren't a lot of levels where just the level name evokes, you know, memories and people <laughs> know it, but you have I'm, multiple under your belt. Um, I've, I've, I've had a very lucky career. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of them uh, we even worked on together. So uh, Mo here uh, was behind All Gillied Up from Modern Warfare 1, which is, was was that the E3 reveal? Um, that was one of them. I actually, not to toot my own horn, but there was actually two E3 reveals. It was uh, All Gillied Up, which was the car, not All Gillied Up, um, Crew Expendable, which was the cargo ship level, and yeah, yeah. All Gillied Up, yeah, which was hellacious because I had to get them both ready for E3. <laughs> oh, no. You were on both those levels, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I interviewed at Infinity Ward seeing you guys showed me the, the cargo ship level, and I was just like, yeah, my, my <laughs> drop off. It was pretty sweet. Awesome. Um, and then you went on to, in Modern Warfare 2 to do No Russian. Yeah. <laughs> Holy... <laughs> <laughs> A very memorable which, level. We, which we wasn't have... like... Nobody thought it was going to blow up that way. Definitely. I mean, you play the level and it's, you can clearly tell it's not designed as like a bombastic level, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it ended up making Fox News and uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe not, not in the great way. Yes, it did. Um, let's, uh, before we get into to some of the games you've made and, and your career, let's uh, go back to your beginnings. Before you were uh, a game developer, you were on a trajectory to become a doctor, isn't that right? If, if memory yeah, serves. Yeah, yeah. I actually, yeah. So um, I always liked making uh, games as a hobby, like even before video games. Like I couldn't afford Magic when it came out. It was too expensive. So I made my own card game. I wasn't oh, really? considering <laughs> myself a designer. Looking back on it, it's just like, oh, yeah, I guess I was doing this for a while. But for me, it was just like, I really like Magic, but I can't afford to play it. So I'm going to make my own version of it um that me and my friends played and then when doom 2 came out uh i love that game and i wanted to like oh yeah make levels for it but it was too complicated but then duke nukem 3d came out and i was like that i hit the ground running with that right um all the way through college it was always like a fun hobby of mine right yeah uh, as far as a career i was i was just always in my head that i was going to become a surgeon as far back as i can remember <laughs> right all right and I uh, went to Virginia Tech, and I uh, double majored in biology and chemistry, uh, and I was, uh, at the time, so that's when, like, Counter-Strike blew up, and, like, yeah. the, like basically, like, the internet in general blew up. Like, this is, like, 1998 to 2002 era, right? Yeah, yeah. And I started, like, I started, like, joining, like, different mod projects for Half-Life, because it was, like, a... 
bustling Half-Life mod community at the time. And oh, yeah. at that time, I'd like moved on to like start making like Half-Life uh, levels, right? What, while you're going to school to become a surgeon? Yeah, yeah. again, just as a hobby. Right? <laughs> just for fun. I, I say as a hobby, but I would work on my level f for like eight, nine hours a day. I, I would like skip class to go to my to work on my shit. <laughs> but it was just fun, right? I never, yeah. I never took it seriously as a career because I never thought I was good enough to get paid for it. That's just the reality, right? And the thought never even entered my mind. Turns uh, out. In my mind, say what? <laughs> It turns out you were. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> in, in, in my head, people who make video games were like amazing, and I was just some like you know kid in my dorm room, like working on a level. Um, but yeah, so what happened? What changed the course of my career was uh, my senior year of college. Uh, I'd applied to like you know thirty medical schools, and and I was uh, sending off my final application. Uh, I was like, you know, check my mailbox and I got a copy of PC Gamer, like Euro PC Gamer, okay. which wasn't a surprise for me because I knew because uh, I was working on this mod and the head of the mod was like, hey, they're PC Gamers doing like, um, like a section on Half-Life mods and we're in there. I'm like, oh, sweet. And I was like, can you send me a copy? He's like, yeah, absolutely. And he sends me a copy, but he didn't tell me he wanted it to be a surprise. Was it was like a four page spread on just our mod, and every single image was from my levels. And there was like seven other people working <laughs> on that game, and I was just like, I was like, holy crap, this is amazing! And I was like, what? Why? Why is it all my stuff? He was like, dude, are you kidding? He's like, your stuff's the best stuff. And I'm like, huh? And then like the next page was this ad for full sale, and I was like, I'm gonna not go to medical school. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah, and like my girlfriend at the time was like you could always like defer your acceptance you should go like try this it's your dream and i was like okay i will and again at the time it was stupid i don't know why i decided to go back to school but you know back in 2002 that's what you did right you went to college that's <laughs> that's that's why we all had like a billion dollars in debt right yeah. <laughs> so yeah like so yeah that completely changed my life i ended up not going to medical school Ended up going to Full Sail instead. I had to lie to my parents. I told them I didn't get into medical school. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask how how they reacted to that. You, they were I, I would say, like, they you were your parents, livid. I'm not going to be a surgeon. I'm going to make video games instead. Yeah, I know, right? Especially back then in 2002, right? What They're the like, you're going to what? <laughs> you need a real job. So you literally lied to them. You told them. I had to lie to them. I had to. Like, okay. Just, you know, 21, 22, I was still under the thumb of my parents. Like, There's no fucking way they were going to let me not go to medical school. So, yeah, I just told them I didn't get in. So this is my backup plan. And they were pissed, obviously. Uh, but once I got out, uh, I, the first game I worked on was Call of Duty 2. Which Man, was with, super with, lucky, right? With Infinity super, War. Super lucky. Yeah, super lucky. And yeah. then, obviously, after that, in Modern Warfare, they were very proud of me, so... It was clearly the right choice. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, let's talk about um, No Russian a little bit. That that level was uh, we worked on it together. I did a lot of the blood effects for it. You were you were the primary designer. I remember one moment, which you know everyone that played the game experienced it too in the end. But during development, this just turned on one day, where I go down the escalator, and all the the signs for the different cities went delayed, delayed, delayed. delayed, delayed, delayed. Dude, I like, yeah, I, I got the feels. <laughs> that. That's so fucking cool. <laughs> I don't remember what film I had recently seen. It might have been that that Tom Hanks movie where he's like, he seeks political asylum and they won't let him into the U.S., but he can't fly back home and he's just stuck in the airport. I can't remember the name of this movie. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. But uh, I remember in that movie like there was this cool scene with like the instead of the digital readouts they had like the old ticker airport signs and i was like that's really neat i love that sound i'm like i'm gonna put that in <laughs> oh, yeah. that's actually my entire career i just steal things from everybody else <laughs> i remember one funny anecdote from from that uh that little moment in time they had um they had ridley scott into the office right do you remember that if you remember they, this yeah yeah, they brought him in. To, they, they were, there was talk about a COD movie, and they brought him in, and they showed him. It was just like Jason and Vince, and I think maybe Drew Steve. or somebody. A, a Fukuda, yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, they and and I remember when they finished with him, they you know kind of debriefed us and like, yeah, he was he was like, how was that all one shot? I, I guess. <laughs> Like well, in a video game, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah must be funny. Um, now, in the end, in the in the in the shipping version of the game, there was a there was a warning twice yeah. when you started the game, and then when you started the level, to let you um, to skip it, and it wouldn't affect you know the narrative it, that it was fine to do. Um, Talk about how that came. That wasn't in the plan to begin with. It, it no, came and in fact, I was like, it ended up being a cool really, thing. You were I against was adamantly it. opposed to it, actually. Really? But, really? Uh, yeah, but in the end, it was the right choice. But yeah, let me let me let me walk you through this a little bit. So, what happened was, um, we you know we often brought Kleenex testers to play the game, and for those who don't know what a Kleenex tester is, it's like a Kleenex. You use it once, and you throw it away. It's not meant to like actually test the bugs in your game. It's meant to test that first time experience, right? So we would always bring in Kleenex testers like halfway through development to play like finished to unfinished levels just to see if we were in the right direction, what changes we need to make. And that one always like had like interesting reactions out of people, right? Because yeah. I mean, that was the point of the level to like make you like pause for a second, right? Um, but one of the ones I remember was this uh, veteran who came in, who played video games, and he, like, walks out, and he instantly realizes that he's not on the good guy's side. And he's about to yeah. mow down uh, some civilians, and he just literally puts the controller down. Like, he, he, he was like, I'm not playing this game. And we skipped him past that level, and we let him play the rest of the game, and he absolutely loved it. I didn't think much of it, but Jason West, who was game director at the time, it really struck a chord with him. And he was like, that's just one dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's like, when we release this out to the masses, that's going to be the reaction from millions of people. And millions of people are going to stop playing the game at the third level. Right? And, again, he was right. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like He was like, we should put out a disclaimer to be like, hey, there's a level that, like, if you don't want to play it, you don't have to. And it won't, like, you know, it won't hurt your uh, progression. It won't hurt, like, none of the achievements are in that level. We made sure no achievements were in that level. Um, and I was adamantly against it because I thought it was kind of like a cop-out. I didn't see his point of view. From my point of view, it was like, we're touching on something, like, serious and profound. And then, we're, like, we're almost being like, but you know what? We shouldn't do this. We shouldn't touch on something serious and profound. So we're going to back out of it. And I felt terrible about that. Because, again, this is before The Last of Us. This is before video games went down serious avenues. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was like, I, I wanted to do this. I wanted to, I wanted to make a video game to, like, cross into, like, you know, what film and TV have been doing for years, right? Uh, and I felt like this was, like, kind of a half step. But, again, at the time, it was definitely the right call. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and you're I like I feel like that I'm proud to have been a part of that moment. It it was I think a, a maturing of the medium. Like that was that was a step of it sort of growing up in, in in a way. A little bit, yeah. And I I definitely like felt it while I was making it because at first I was like just kind of like a not really giving much thought to it and we work on, you know, war games i've been working on war games at this point for like five six years and i was just like yeah i'm gonna mow down everybody i'm gonna have you know children <laughs> in there and blah, blah blah and i was and as i was i was like maybe i shouldn't have children in there you know I mean? and i was like slowly like censoring myself and realizing that like <laughs> you yeah. know like maybe i shouldn't like take it to the extreme that i possibly can because i didn't want it to be shock value like there was games like postal you know what i mean that were like intended as shock value and this was like not meant to be distasteful. It was just meant to make you like pause, right? Yeah. yeah. And and in the end, some of the little tiny sort of like fail success details in there, I remember being being received well in that like there was a subtle gradient in you if you didn't shoot at all, you couldn't get through the level, they would turn on you. If you shot but didn't kill anybody, you could do that. That was a viable yeah. way to get through. You didn't like, have to kill a single person. Intentionally so, right? That was yeah. that was a path. Um, and that that was cool. And so there was a wide variety in, you know, just different players, how how they cared to do it. Some people just went in, you know, guns a blazing. Some people were were thoughtful about it and careful and, and didn't harm any <laughs> anyone. <laughs> 
which is yeah. The know. only thing you couldn't do was shoot them. That was like that was the only level of like freedom I couldn't give you because that would just like completely break the story, right? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. the level. <laughs> sure. um, very cool. I remember. I remember. Um coming in on the weekend to do some of the blood <laughs> effects i looked up all kinds of like movie blood recipes and like <laughs> came in with my girlfriend at the time and got down to my jeans and i and i crawled through the office and left trails behind and wait really out. for the yeah. for like the crawling blood trip that's amazing yeah. i did not know that <laughs> yeah there was there you know even people that were crawling away would would drip blood and that would no, I, I totally remember i did not know you came to the office and like actually like yeah. tested it out to see like what kind of trailer would leave that's i totally did we, dude we had the uh the concrete you know like like pathways between yeah. all the offices that everyone would scoot around on yeah <laughs> Wow, this is amazing. I learn something new every time when I talk about this. <laughs> yeah, crazy. And all gillied up was a was an amazing level too. I like, like I it was just shocking too. Like, like you, you know, the setup is they're they're the bad guys are coming towards you and they're like they're gonna step on your fucking head. And, <laughs> and then like when you the character stand up out of the grass, you totally didn't even see there. That was like that was a miracle of graphics <laughs> for for that, that was all Joel Emsley. That's what that was. <laughs> yeah. So, so I remember, so we had that, like, we had that, like, early on, like, the character being right in front of you. Because that was the whole plan. I was like, if if you can sell that he's literally right in front of you and you can't see him, then you believe the rest of the mission, right? I, I can kind of, I can do anything I want. But I need to sell this moment, right? And God bless Joel Emsley. Uh, he was, he was, like, artist or lead artist at the time. And he's art director now on uh, the new model of her. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so he worked on that for no joke months, matching the grass shader to the same shader on the character. And like, cause they went through, if I'm not mistaken, two different like pipelines in the render. So they couldn't literally be the same, but he was just constantly working on that. And then like, you know, three months later, something would change. And then those two wouldn't match up again. He'd be like, God damn it. And you have to work on it again to like make sure they match up. <laughs> but he yeah. was just as passionate about that moment as I was. So I never had to like go bug him about it. He was always like, he instantly noticed it wasn't right. And he'd like, just go and fix it. Love that guy. It's great. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there was some, there was some special mojo at that, in, in that place at that time. Like, I mean, I felt like almost everyone there was was like lead level caliber, even even this, you know, just sort of standard, you know, production, you know, artists and designers and everything. Um, yeah, it was amazing, like what we, we could pull off with such a small team like these days. Know, some hundred, are, less than yeah. 100 people. <laughs> Crazy. It's wild. Crazy. And like it, it, it's there's a big difference, right? Like, you know, you need a lot of management and and production we had two two producers two oh, I, I think we had Ruben, two producers that's Ruben and pete <laughs> i know right but and, and that's uh honestly it's it's because of our hiring practices we hired very strictly right like basically anybody we hired we needed to be sure that if we put them into a room for a year they would hit the ground running right and they would like be self-sufficient and they wouldn't need any help not that, that we would actually do that you know what i mean like that's it's part of the magic of having a small team of 80 people is the fact that like you can actually collaborate more if you have like a giant team, you know what I mean? Where you're stuck in meetings all day. Um, yep. But, uh, but yeah, everybody was so high level. So, so everybody was so self-sufficient. It was great. Is is that a, a vibe you're looking forward to getting back now? You you guys are, are a new. Oh, we've got it back. <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh, it's, it's the good old days again at uh wildlife. I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> like we have, like less than 30 right now i think or maybe right at 30 we just hired a couple engineers and it's it's got that same energy everybody we hire like is like very very talented in like one specific field but has a broad spectrum of talent in other fields too which is great right yeah. like our tech artist for example also happens to be a fantastic animator <laughs> right. right so <laughs> Like, until we, like, build up an animation team, he can totally support it, you know what I mean? And, you know, half of our designers are entry-level programmers. Half of our programmers are really good designers. <laughs> Everybody wears a lot of hats, you know what I mean? That's awesome. Yeah, I, I remember, like, seeing 
it was a long time ago now, but the the Valve like employee handbook got leaked. You know, I think mm. back then when when we were in Infinity Ward, but they talked about like the T shaped employee yeah. where you go deep on one thing but also can function in other. It's uh, very true. It's actually employee. really hard to find these days, to be honest. Everybody's so specialized, especially designers yeah. coming out of school. There, if, if there's any designers in school listening to this, take what I'm about to say to heart. <laughs> a lot of designers are taught that the end of your job stops with the problem. That is not true. <laughs> I miss the days of modding where we would hire designers from the mod scene because those designers, they knew how to solve problems. They knew how to make art. They knew how like a good, like, uh, what do you call it? Like a Vista looks, you know, they knew about sound, about animation. They knew about like character design and placement like because they had to <laughs> you know what i mean because they didn't work yeah. on a team of like 80 specialists right yeah. so they had to and the th thing about that is you'll never be a specialist in that field but if but if you know it one you can talk their language and two you know what's missing from your design you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, I, I, I felt lucky in, in my sort of come up before Infinity Ward. I worked at a few places. My, my first job at was Wild Tangent, which was kind of a fun, you know, I, were, I made advert games, like <laughs> companies, websites, which are kind of dumb. But it gave me like the, the great thing that came out of that, though, is I did every art job there was there. I Ooh. did I did mocap. I did character art, lighting, environments, UI art direction, outsource managing, like anything that could be done in, in art, I touched all of it. And it really helped with effects in the end in that you kind of have to do that. You got to rig shit and animate yeah. it. I mean, effects and... touches everything. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, speaking of, of, you know, building a new studio too, like one, one, one thing that, um, you know, we're both sort of going through that now, right? We've, our team's, you know, five years old. So we're sort of in our infancy, we're 16 people. Um, and we talk about sort of culture and, and, and things. I, I remember, you know, back in the, the heyday of infinity war, there were a lot of shenanigans <laughs> going on and, and, <laughs> and joking. Uh, and, you know, you hear in the news, you know, that gone wrong, right? Like studios oh, yeah, where sure. it gets out of control and, and harassment stuff. And, you know, I, the, that's the one thing I've thought about and talked about with my team is is how to strike a balance there where you want work, you want making a game, we're, we're creating fun, we're creating entertainment, you want, you want to be around people that you like and make you laugh and you want to joke and have a good time. But it's important, but we want, you know, we don't want to exclude people, we don't, you know, certainly we don't want people getting harassed. Right, I don't know, that's something yeah, I've sure. thought about is, is, you know, on, on one hand, you could just go like hard, like, you know, no one may talk about politics or make any jokes about anything or like, you know, that's one way to handle it. The whole that's, corporate approach. Yeah. Which yeah. is just like, don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. just, just shut up and do your job. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's not, I don't know. That's not fun. Like, like my, some, some of my greatest experience in game dev were there was, you know, there was stupid shit going on. And I don't know how, have you guys thought about that or talked about it for your team? How, how do oh, you, yeah, for sure. I mean, balance? I, I think also just like being in the industry for so long, like, you know, I've seen it change, you know what I mean? We've all been products of our environment, you know what I mean? I feel like a lot of us have changed along with it in good ways, you know what I mean? And the ones that kind of like dig their heels in, you know what I mean? Or like, no, I don't want to change, blah, blah, blah. They're kind of looking at it the wrong way, you know what I mean? Like, it's not about not having fun. It's, it's just about not having fun at somebody else's expense. It's that simple. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like comedy that used to be funny, used to be funny to you. You know what I mean? Like, and it might still be, but there's some comedy that used to be funny to you, but it's really in poor taste now when you look at it. <laughs> yeah. Because it was at somebody else's expense and it made other people feel uncomfortable. You, just because you didn't see those people being uncomfortable doesn't mean they weren't. You just didn't feel comfortable to voice it back then. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. But like, I, I think there's a lot to say about like, the closer you are with people, obviously, like, the more those boundaries can come down, too. You know what I mean? Smaller teams help with this. But that's, again, that's that's only, like, a little bit. Like, it's it's just really about, like, not being rude and not being crass and respecting other people. It's as simple as that. You know what I mean? Yeah. But we s still have fun. Again, thankfully, because we're a small team, the whole corporate environment, ugh, I hate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not conducive to a creative culture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, well, like another thing that, that that comes in with bigger teams is is meetings. I I've as time have has gone on, <laughs> I try to d- decline all meetings unless they're like that's that's what happened. Meeting is is like a recurring meeting. Like I don't think yeah. I need to be at any <laughs> recurring meeting. Yeah, like, actually, that's a really. I mean, here's it's it's a tough balance, right? Like, so that's what so Apex shipped with 120 people, and already at 120, that was the largest team. When I say we, I mean we as a like the collective group of people who'd been working together for over a decade, right? Um, it's the largest team we'd ever had because we we tend to like sub ninety. I, I feel like that's the sweet spot. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where you can still know everybody's name and you don't have these like permanent meetings that like recur. And you only have meetings that you need, and it's you're fast and you're agile, right? Now, obviously, the downside to that is you can't make endless content. Right. When you switch to a live service, like launching a live service game, we could do that with 120 people on Apex. But if you notice the first couple seasons of Apex were like really lacking content, it's because we never expected it to take off as fast as it did. So we were like, well, we'll have room to ramp up. We didn't have time to ramp up, <laughs> but we ramped up like quick to something like, I think internally over 300 and then internally and externally over 600. It's, it was insane. You know what I mean? And, the number one thing that grew out of that was organization because you need to organize 300 people and that's where all the meetings come from. And it's kind of, it's a double-edged sword, right? Like you need the meetings because there's no way you can keep track of what 300 people are doing. You know what I mean? Without them. But yeah. at the same time, you become highly inefficient with all those meetings too. Yeah. It, it eats time. And by the way, the apex launch was one of my favorite <laughs> of the coolest launches ever. Like I remember, so it was pre COVID, right? So, so this, this was our office yeah. before now it's kind of my, you know, little man cave, but we had six people sitting in the room here and then another desk back there. And, uh, we were all w- watching it. Uh, your guys at Vince announcing it. And in the end of it, when he's like, and it's playable now, we're like, what download, <laughs> <laughs> we just stopped working and played apex like right then. <laughs> that, that yeah, it's funny. Cool. Like. Because a lot of people were like, were like, wow, what a crazy, like, Beyonce mic drop. I can't believe they did that. Oh, what a brilliant marketing thing. And, you know, Ar- Arturo, who was, uh, Arturo Castro, who was, like, our head of marketing at the time, uh, it, like, it was definitely, like, his his baby. But it was, like, kind of, like, a concerted effort between, like, him and Steve and me and uh, Drew and kind of everybody just kind of realizing that, like, there was no good way to message that the team that made Titanfall 2 is making a BR only game in that universe and it's not Titanfall 3 but it has all the same weapons right and a, not a similar art style but like there's like the, the world is there right the pilots are there the buildings come from that world and it's just like there's no good way to message this you put out any trailer for this and it's just going to be eaten alive by a billion people who've never played it before <laughs> you know what i mean and we were yeah, like yeah, there's, there's no there's no way to market it so we're like we're not going to we're not going to market it we're, the way we're going to do it is we're just going to drop it and like have all this marketing material but then be like go play it right now so that people could actually play it before anybody could shit on it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Because when you do, if people just played the damn game, they would like it. (laughs) Yeah, and it was true. It was phenomenal. (laughs) Tell us some of the the, the favorite stuff that that you worked on in in Apex. Uh, So Apex is interesting. Apex, I took a very different role uh, than I normally do. My, My entire career, I've been basically a mission designer and gameplay designer, right? Um, And... For Apex, obviously, there's no missions. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's, there's no missions in that. And as far as, like, systems-driven design goes, I'm, like, I'm a decent scripter. I, like, I can definitely make levels and, like, I can do, like, technical stuff. But I really shouldn't be writing robust script that other scripters need to touch and, like, build off of. I'm bad at that. So okay. there really wasn't a place for me to do that. Um, but... You know, I noticed that there was a kind of like a, a an empty space for character design, right? Not so much the um, not so much the abilities because we had like a couple designers like uh, Stephen DeRose and um, Griffin who worked amazing at that. But what I mean by character design was like I noticed there was like we're making characters, 
but we're only really thinking about it as like gameplay, not about like how an entire character is, right? Like the artists right. were making like amazing concept drawings and like the animators making amazing animations on what they assumed these characters were like, but I was like, this is not Jello. I was like the gameplay and the voice and it, I was like, this needs to come together to make a, like a real character. So I was kind of was like, you know, I asked my lead at the time, Mackie, I was like, can I, can I kind of spearhead this? And he's like, yeah, go for it. And what started off is like me and my little corner expanded to like basically me turning into the, the narrative design director and like basically being the go-to between all the different departments to make sure that like we're all like making like a concerted effort to make like a unified character. Right. And I think the favorite thing for me was kind of stepping into a role I've never done before and kind of like, I never appreciated like what a lead does, you know what I mean? Until that moment. And I kind of realized it's like not really about coming up with the cool ideas. That's th thankfully I work with extremely talented people. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has a plethora of amazing ideas. That's actually not the problem. The problem is kind of like making sure that like, these ideas aren't fighting each other, but kind of like working towards like a single vision. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, it, it was just, it was a really interesting process to like do that. Awesome. And it's like, I think this career, one of the things that's, that's always kind of fun about it is it's, it's just moving so damn fast. Right. <laughs> like you cannot stay stagnant in this and, and, no, definitely not. And effects in particular too, like, man, the tech just, just advances. You, there's so much to keep up with, but it, it keeps it from getting stale. Right. And, and a lot of, in yeah, some disciplines, it's like, you're doing, yeah, I mean, the tools advance a bit, but you're kind of doing more or less the same thing forever. So whenever you're, you're outside of your comfort zone, like doing stuff you've never done before that that's always that's exciting, when, right? That's when you're learning, you're growing and yeah, I, I, I love those moments. Yeah. That's. Super exciting. Um, do you have a favorite character of all of them? That you <laughs> I have so many favorite characters. So <laughs> I'm, I'm a little partial to Mirage because we, uh, like, that was one of the first characters, you know, we kind of worked on. And, you, you know, they say, like, you know, build what you know. And I'd never, like, really done character design before. So I was like, well, I'm going to kind of make him like me. He's going to be all a right. little self deprecating. He's going to be a little smarmy. <laughs> he's going to, like, you know, <laughs> he's going to have some, like, you know, off color jokes that don't always land. <laughs> yeah. He's trying to be like a party, but he's like, he's like a bit of a nerd. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, but no, I like, there is, there is a bunch of characters. I really like Revenant. Revenant, I love. Re Revenant was the season four launch. That was kind of my baby. Um, so, like, up until that, we were doing uh, these uh, launch trailers that were very much about, like, um, very much about selling the game. Here's the new map. Here's the new weapon. Here's the new character, right? And they were very, yeah. like, it, a little cookie cutter, in my opinion. You know they're what I mean? Clinical. They're, yeah. they're clinical, yeah. They were super well done, right? But, like, they're just... It wasn't gelling, right? Because you go watch the trailer, and then you go play the game, and you just don't feel, like, that umph, right? And I was like, let me, let's try something for season four. I was like, we've got skins that come out with the season. We've got a weapon, we've got a map, we've got a character. Let's see if we can kind of like coalesce this into one big marketing beat, right? Kind of like bring it all together, like make the skins based off of like the theme, right? And I don't remember exactly what theme I ended up coming up with, but I was like, like all the big wigs at uh, EA uh, were like, no, no, that's not what people want. You need to show them the battle pass and you show them the skin and you show them the weapon and like you show them the thing that they're going to buy. And I'm just like, no, nah, people don't give a shit about that. People care about stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, give them a good story and they'll come, you know, and they'll, and they'll play your game. Thankfully yeah. I had two awesome champions in my corner, Drew Stoffer, uh, who did like all our videos and uh, Jason Torfin, who was like our marketing guru. And basically they went to bat for me. Uh, for, at, like to the big wigs, and they were like, "Let him do this, let him do this." So we did it, and sure enough, that trailer was like, came out like awesome, and like you know, oh, yeah. Revenant has one line in the entire, <laughs> in the entire thing, you know what I mean? But it like it worked, and like I, that was that was a super fun character for me because like I didn't uh, actually create uh, like that was like one of the first characters I didn't create actually. That was that was Tom 
we had hired a new writer, uh, and that was like his first character. But that was the one I felt like finally like lived the dream of what Apex is trying to be, right? Which is like the characters are the driving force behind like the gameplay and the story and the marketing and everything. Hell yeah, fuck, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's let's talk about uh, Titanfall uh, a bit. So so you know so we parted ways after after Infinity Ward. You, you got you went on to make Respawn, and Titanfall was your first game. Give us a few uh, stories, anecdotes, stupid oh, shit that happened in the God. office. <laughs> give it give it give us some Titanfall, some Titanfall nuggets. Titanfall was <laughs> a disaster in so many ways, but also <laughs> but also amazing. Also a massive hit. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, like Titanfall is a roller coaster. So first of all, we started respawn without a fucking clue what we're gonna make and in the middle of a lawsuit right and uh in the the middle of this uh we're like you know going to what we knew which was like you know military style shooters but we didn't want to just you know make the same thing we'd made before so we ended up like you know trying a bunch of different things in the beginning and ended up finally settling on titans and that's an entire story in and of itself but i remember this is the team that made call of duty and at some point, yeah. uh, Jason and Steve, uh, who ended up becoming game director, were like, new project, new team, new engine, new IP. They're like, need, oh, to, need, need, like need something to give, right? Yeah. yeah. So it was like, single player gone. And yeah. I just remember when they made that announcement, like, my heart sank. You know what I mean? Like, that was all I ever wanted to work on <laughs> was single player yeah. games, right? And I like just left Infinity Ward to come start this new company. <laughs> the dream of like making the best single player shooter ever, right? And it was just like cut. It was like Ugh. Uh, like for a split second I actually like considered like working at other jobs and like other things. But like it was oh, like, it was like a dark time. And I'm not the only one who felt that way. But um okay. I, I remember I made a decision. I mean, like, and I'm so happy I did. And ever since then, like, I've I've been able to quantify it and put it into words. It's team over project, right? And I've yeah. always realized the project doesn't really matter. You know, I, I, I could be happy working on anything if I'm working with the right people, right? Because working right. with the right people means that I can count on them. I know they're, they're like rock stars and we work well together. And whatever we end up making, it's going to be good, right? Even if I personally am not, invested in like the actual kind of game we're making you know what i mean so yeah so i stuck around and i'm glad i did because i because i always wanted to make single player games i, I kind of found a way to put my panache on it which was like those intros and outros and making them super cinematic and everything and it was such a hard road to e3 a lot of <laughs> self-doubt you know what i, I mean like <laughs> it's, it's so much self-doubt right Wow. But then I remember we went to E3 and like all of us were nervous because like we, we just didn't know. And then E3 was amazing. The reception was incredible. I think we won Crushed. like uh, like an insane number of E3 awards. And it was just like it was vindicating, right? We, like we went back to the office and like it was like basically like all right, crunch until the project's finished. Because again, it's the first game we made. We had nothing else other than that E3 level that we showed. But it was like the most enthusiastic crunch of my life. I was like, yeah! <laughs> Hell yeah, awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> but then you guys got to, there was a single player in Titanfall 2. So did you did you sort of re- go back to doing single player design in, in Titanfall 2? Oh yeah, absolutely. So Titanfall, so, so one of the biggest complaints of Titanfall 1 was that it was a $60 box product with only a multiplayer component, right? Which nowadays it's like so common <laughs> but like back then it was like yeah. people were in like fucking uproar like how dare yeah. they <laughs> yeah, sure. but like it also didn't have a ton of content in it either because again like i said we shipped that game with like 80 people <laughs> you cannot make yeah. a ton of content with like a little amount of people but we had our engine we had our world we had our ip you know what i mean and like we knew that like we could make massive strides in the multiplayer and the engine and we knew we wanted to make a single player game. And we knew the, the the audience wanted it too, right? And dude, that game Titanfall 2 is my I'm the most proud of that. I know the stuff I made for Modern Warfare 1 and 2 is a lot more popular, but I feel like the design of Titanfall 2 is like 
top fucking notch. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah like I just, I, I don't know where it happened, but like we started coalescing into this thing where it's like, yeah, every level is just going to be something different and something unique. And then we're just going to throw it away and give you something new. Every level. <laughs> <laughs> every level is going to be memorable. <laughs> and it was just like, that, that game is, I love that game. That game is awesome. It's unfortunate that, like, they got sandwiched between, you know, Call of Duty and Battlefield and didn't get, like, the marketing it could have had. And, like, a lot of people, one, didn't realize that it was also on PlayStation. It wasn't just an Xbox launch title because the first one was. A lot of people didn't realize that a single-player campaign because the first one didn't. And they were just like, ah, that's that multiplayer mech shooter. I'm not going to try that. <laughs> yeah, Which is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, what what were the levels you worked on for Titanfall two? Do do you have a favorite moment in it that's like? That, well, that my favorite moment is not my the level I worked on. My favorite moment is everybody's favorite moment. It's time travel level, right? That level is amazing. <laughs> 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 so we had this phase we uh, we call action blocks, where in the prototyping phase we're just making like every week we're making a quick like thirty second to five minute like chunk of gameplay, ugly and dirty, but it's just meant to prove out an idea right and we did that for weeks and yeah. we ended up coming with like i don't know 200 like tiny little mini action blocks and we ended up taking like the best 25 of them making an entire game out of them right awesome and, and i remember jake jake keating so his action block he took two weeks which steve could was very angry about that one <laughs> week he didn't have anything to show right but he took two <laughs> weeks and he made that level and there's a lot of things that changed, obviously, but I'm not kidding where I say half the level that he made in the action block stayed and just got prettied up and improved on. <laughs> wow. It was that good. It was just from the beginning. That idea was amazing. And it didn't fit anywhere in our game at all. And we were like, we don't care. <laughs> we will wrap the story around this fucking level. <laughs> it is that good. <laughs> yeah, that's... One thing that's interesting too is is and, and I've thought about this recently. I, I as, as I've been not to go on a tangent, but as I've been sort of designing my own little dungeon, I'm a D and D fanatic, and I, I I got writer's block a little bit. I was trying to come up with an adventure, and I'm like, and, and I kind of recalled how we were doing it back in the day at Infinity Ward, and it was not far from that. Where I remember we'd have the cork boards up, and then it was locations, gear, and like like an event or something or, or right. something that you did. Right. And anybody fucking the Jan Candace in H in whatever <laughs> office admin, anyone can go put an idea up on these things. And it was just like, you know, the favelas in Brazil or, you know, a drone, like tr a treaded drone thing or whatever. Right. And then you just would vote on like what the coolest thing was. And then how to like come, like, how do you thread a narrative through, through like all these disparate parts? That's part of the magic. But, but I kind of did that with this little adventure that I wrote for some friends of mine and it worked surprisingly well. I'm just, I just pictured like crazy D and D shit happening. And I'm like, <laughs> like, how, how can I string these together? And it was, Turned out awesome. Yeah, it wor it works. Like it 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 doesn't. It's not going to always produce the best story. You know, I'm yeah. not going to say. I'm not going to say. You know, Call of Duty, the original Modern Warfare One and Two, and Titanfall Two had stories that would like rival. You know, Naughty Dogs. No, yeah. <laughs> but they were good. <laughs> yeah, fun. You made, they made sense. <laughs> it's it's interesting that like I mean. Like, you know, like of, of course, Last of Us has been in the news lately for being, you know, both an amazing game and an awesome show now. Awesome TV show, yeah. And so many, so many don't make that jump from a, a game to a movie and vice versa, but it did. I think largely because it was so, like, narrative first, right? Like, yeah, Last of Us. Like, I mean, Naughty Dog has always been that way since, like, the Uncharted series, right? Very much narrative first. Yeah. Um, here's, here's a thing I've been thinking about lately. Um, the Infinity Ward back in the day, I I learned so much there. Like Robert Gaines was my boss. I remember when I interviewed with him, I'm like, man, I want to work here. I like, I know I'm going to learn so much from this guy, and I I did. I learned so much from Robot <laughs> uh, and the whole team. Like, there was just like, it, it's funny that that you know we made greatness with few people, not much like next to no crunch almost no producers it's like there was some magic mojo like in that building at the time and i've wondered like why like what like how how do you quantify what it is 
that they did differently. You mentioned hiring before. I remember like just as time, it wasn't like it was written down, but there was, there were like some, some game dev philosophies there that were these sure. little like mantras that, that I would hear repeated in the office. Tell, tell me, tell me some of them for you. What were things that you learned there that became important? Like the, like it's... game design. <laughs> so much. Like, how do you do it? <laughs> so much, so much. How do you distill that magic? Oh my God. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> first, I, I think probably the easiest one is gameplay first, right? Um, yeah. But I think gameplay first is easy to say, hard to do, right? F for multiple reasons. One, you can like go a little overboard with it. And a lot of people take gameplay first as gameplay only, right? And that's not the case. Because, like, when you say gameplay first to, like, an artist, then we'll think of something different than, like, an animator. You know what I mean? Um, but that's a good thing, right? That's actually a good thing. Because it's what I was saying earlier about, like, designers only, like, coming out of school right now, only thinking that, like, their job ends at solving the problem, right? And I think, like, it's, it's important to, like, and again, I'm not going to, is that the only way to do it? Because like Naughty Dog is definitely narrative first. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like, I feel like that has always worked for us, right? Where we try not to sacrifice gameplay for uh, for anything else. Now, again, the reason I say gameplay first instead of gameplay only is because sometimes you have to sacrifice a little bit of gameplay, but you sacrifice it for the experience, not for any other specific thing. But if the experience will be better by like, you know, pulling the gameplay back so that, like this animation makes more sense or this piece of art makes more sense or something along those lines, then that's, that, that is a worthy sacrifice. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think something else was um, not being uh, too attached to your art, right? Like a lot of people are like their, their work is their worth and that is not true. Your work is <laughs> not your worth, right? Yeah. Because that blinds you to things like, for example, if you've been working on something for a year and it's not good for the game, it should be cut. That doesn't mean you should be cut. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't mean you're not worthy. That just means it should be cut. And I think a lot of people have a hard time cutting. You know what I mean? And that was something we like, for example, the first Modern Warfare before <laughs> before you got there, we literally... Nine months before a ship cut half the game. I'm not even kidding. Half the game we cut. Really? And then started over on half of the game. Because we realized about a year through the development that, oh, we found the fun. This is the fun game. This other stuff that got us to the fun, it was important because it got us here. But we can't ship it. I mean, we can. It's very finished. It's polished. But we shouldn't. <laughs> we can have yeah. a bigger game. We can have an 18 hour game instead of an eight hour game, but that's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So we, we cut it and we had a much, much smaller game, but clearly what was there was like impactful, right? I, I much prefer a sort of tight, awesome, yeah. short <laughs> experience these days. Tell us if you can say what, what are, what are a level or two or, or a thing or two that got cut from Modern Warfare? Oh my I mean, God, dude, was, I have had totally more other. failures than I've had successes. <laughs> <laughs> never seen the light of day I, I can't even begin to count the number of things that have been cut seriously i have like four missions cut from uh cod 2 i had another like four from the first modern warfare i had like ton from like modern Warfare 2 so, there was this uh bunker buster mission in the first modern warfare where basically a bunker buster hits like a bunker and like just basically buries a hole through the center of it and you're basically going around like through the bunker like seeing into different layers along the way it just sucked <laughs> yeah. it was boring bottom line it was boring you know it sounded like a cool idea on paper i worked on it for like a good four months and we cut it and it was terrible <laughs> yeah. um the uh uh man I, I i i don't even know where to begin uh also <laughs> Modern Warfare 2, my level didn't get cut, but I got cut off of a level because I was just screwing it up so bad. So, uh -oh. which one was that? So, so that's another thing that I learned: casting, casting the right developer for the right job, right? And again, you are not your work, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like that, like so. Um, the first mission in Modern Warfare 2, where you're ice climbing, 
Yeah, yeah, I was and on then, that one. Yeah, and then you go and like a, a, a snowstorm hits and you're like shooting people with the heartbeat sensor. Then you get caught and you fight your way out and you like snowmobile out. So that was my level and I was working on that and I was just doing a terrible job because I have a certain like style and it just wasn't fitting that mission. It just, okay. it just wasn't right. It was, I was basically, I was making it too slow. I was not giving you enough freedom to like play it like the way you wanted to. And I got pulled off of it after about like three months. Right. And that was a turning point for me where I like, that could have broken me, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but like, but I, I remember, yeah, but I remember Steve Fukuda was very much like, listen, dude, he was like, you're, you're a good designer. You are not your level. Right. The level you're making right now sucks. That doesn't mean you suck. <laughs> and I got pulled off of that and they gave it to, uh, I want to say Mackie and Z. And clearly what ended up shipping was immaculate. <laughs> right? Yeah. But yeah, like lo lots lots of different things like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you one uh, fun memory of, of that level too. So, so I am some of the vo voices in, I am some of Soap's voice in that level. Wait, what? Uh, like in yeah. the final product? In the final product, yeah. You're kidding. They forgot to like <laughs> not dialogue, but a lot of most all of the opening Oh, level, the excerpts. Like, grunting. Yeah. And, yeah, the excerpts, <laughs> all the, the death, the the Wilhelm. Like if if you fall or we'll die. I <laughs> remember awesome. uh, I was work I was with uh Stephen Miller and Chrissy on that one. And they just put out a call like, hey, who wants to do some fucking I'm like, all right, I'll do it. So they had me get on because we had a gym in the office at the time. They had me get on the treadmill. They're like, full sprint for five minutes, um, and then and then run into the, the thing because we want you to feel like you're out of breath as you're like climbing up the thing. So yeah, I went on the <laughs> treadmill. Oh, just, <laughs> and they made you work. Like, 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 I was fuck. I was fully out of breath, and they're like, okay, do it. <clears throat> <clears throat> So like all of those grunts is, are me, and then if you fall down to your death, yeah, that's me too. It's hilarious because I bet you anything when they went into the studio with a real actor, he was just sipping tea. And like, oh. they made you work for it. Oh uh, yeah, it was awesome. Oh dude, yeah, I, okay, you want to hear a crazy cut story? I got okay. here's this one. Uh, Titanfall three. <laughs> You know, Titanfall 2 was, you know, came out, did what it did, and we were like, okay, well, we're going to make Titanfall 3. And we worked on Titanfall 3 for about 10 months, right? In earnest, right? I mean, we had, like, new tech for it. We had multiple missions going. We had a first playable, which was, like, on par to be just as good, if not better, than... um than whatever we had before, right? But I'll make this clear, incrementally better. It wasn't revolutionary. And that's the key okay. thing, right? Um, and we were like, feeling pretty decent about it, but not the same feeling as Titanfall 2. We were, we were making something revolutionary. You know what I mean? Uh, and then the multiplayer team was having a hell of a time trying to uh, fix the multiplayer. Because a lot of people love multiplayer. People love Titanfall 2 multiplayer. But the people who yeah. love Titanfall 2 multiplayer is a very small number of people. And most people play Titanfall 2 multiplayer and think it's really good, but it's just too much. It's cranked up to 11, and they burn out of it fast. And they're like, that was a great multiplayer. But that's not something I continually play for like a year, two years, three years. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we were like trying to fix that. We tried to fix that from Titanfall 1 to 2, tried to fix it from Titanfall 2 to 3. The multiplayer team was like just dying. And then PUBG came out. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember Alex Roycewitz, but Alex Roycewitz started playing oh, yeah. PUBG, and then Geoff started playing PUBG, and then they made of a course. battle royale map with you know <laughs> Titanfall uh, three classes. Showed up one day, and then <laughs> literally, like I don't, I know, I'm sure you remember, we used to have like Friday night fights to test like the Hell multiplayer. Yeah. So Friday night fights had like dwindled down to like, you know, 10 people, just the bare minimum, who like to get like a match going to test things out. Just basically the designers and a couple artists, right? Okay. And then that came out and then the next Friday night fights was all 100 people. And they stayed <laughs> until like 9 p.m. playing it, right? And you it was you got something on your hands. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it and it was it was that way for like 2 months. Like, it, it, I think it started in, like, October, November, and it was all the way 
it was like that until we went out for break. And in the middle of that, we were still testing the other modes. Regular attrition and Titanfall modes. And again, 10 people would play those. 100 people would play the BR mode, right? All right. <laughs> and uh, at the time, I was... Uh, I'd, I'd just literally become like narrative lead designer on on Titanfall three. I had just pitched like the mission that like me and Manny had like that mission that the the story of the whole game that me and Manny had come up with me this big presentation and then we went off a break and then we came back from break and we talked about it and we're like, yeah, we need to pivot and we need to go make oh, this man. game. <laughs> <laughs> we literally canceled Titanfall three ourselves because we were like, we can make this game and it's going to be a little. It's going to be Titanfall 2 plus a little bit better, or we can make this thing, which is clearly amazing. <laughs> and don't get yeah. me wrong, I will always miss <laughs> having another Titanfall. You know what I mean? I, like, I love that game. Titanfall 2, like I said, is my most, it's my most crowning achievement, but it was the right call. That is, that is a crazy cut. Such a crazy cut that EA didn't even know about it for another six months until we had a prototype up and running that we could show them. <laughs> Yeah, that th they're fucking skunk works, man. Like, like, yeah, Jason events were they they would they would shield the team and and yeah, that was it was crazy. It, are, <laughs> that is amazing. Um, that had to hurt though. Like you personally, like you 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 just come up with the story of the game and like you you become in love with it. You become attached to it. And and again, like you said, the, the love you are not your level, but like that's a little different. You, like so here's the funny thing. <laughs> On Titanfall 1, they said cut single player, and I almost quit, and I picked a team over project, and I stayed. And I remember that was a dark time. Then we made t finish Titanfall 1, finish Titanfall 2. When we did that, and they were like, all right, we know your narrative design lead, and we know you've always wanted to do this, but it's cut. I was like... Just promoted you to it. All right, let's go. All right. <laughs> Literally, it was that fast. I was like, okay. that's fine. You know what I mean? We've always cut stuff in the past. I know this team's gonna make something awesome. Let's let's run with it. I'll f I'll figure out a place where I can like make my magic. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, I think that's I'm just... between somebody with like nine years of experience and somebody with fifteen years of experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 helpful to have that perspective for sure. I can imagine like, yeah, I'm just picturing like EA's response when you tell them like <laughs> that you're not doing the game. I wish I could have been in that room. All I saw was the reactions to it like from like drew and vince and they were not good <laughs> like like they had to take the brunt of it they were like, i can only imagine they were like yeah you have this game that sold x million copies you went from making the third one a you know a uh a 60 dollar box product which by the way we bought your company for like they bought respawn in the middle of this <laughs> They were like, we bought it so you would make, so we'd have the IP to Titanfall and you'd make a Titanfall 3. And then you come back and tell us you're going to make a free to play non Titanfall game? What the fuck? <laughs> they were like, they didn't know what to do. <laughs> I'll bet. I'll bet. Man, I know. That's crazy. Um, but it worked out. Like, it worked Apex Obviously, it worked been out. Right? a huge hit and, and a, a massive game. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> another another thing that that uh that's crazy too is just, just the thing of the irony too of you know sort of jason and vince and and the um infinity you know heads of call of duty and uh vince just got promoted to now be the head of battlefield yeah uh, that that's sort of a, a turn of turn of events <laughs> <laughs> i'm not too surprised about that like clearly he knows how to run well very effective teams right yeah and like, you know, I'm sure EA wishes Battlefield, you know, wasn't struggling the way it was since Battlefield 1, which did like amazing. So I'm sure they're like, hey, Vince, maybe go do something over here. <laughs> yeah. Full, full circle. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, because he started with Battlefield. That's right. Or no. Yeah. Sorry, no, 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 no. Medal of Honor, but he started with Medal EA. Honor, yeah. Yeah. Which was that? Was that under? I think that was under EA. Yeah, it was too, 2015, yeah. which was under EA. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that is amazing. Um, yeah, Jason and Vince. I mean, you know, in my my time with them, you you worked under them a lot more. They they were super well regarded. They were, you know, like, you know, I I have fond memories of of working for them. I'd, we'd go to people's birthday parties, and they'd be there in the backyard having a beer with you and barbecue. For sure, that was awesome. 
Um, Mo, this has uh, been a great chat. Uh, every time I hang out with you is amazing. I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> miss you too, buddy. Uh, thank it you sucks. so much for uh, <laughs> coming on the show. Um, <laughs> This, uh, a couple of housekeeping things before we go to, uh, I can be found my own personal, uh, YouTube and Twitch channel. I mostly Twitch, uh, I don't know, vintage games and D and D stuff, but I can be found undertone underscore DJ. Do you have any, any socials that you want to shout out? Yeah, sure. Like, uh, if you kind of want to just, you know, keep up with what I'm doing and you know, my, uh, <laughs> my mental stream <laughs> I'm on Twitter. It's I am bad mofo. Like I am bad mofo. That's right. You are. <laughs> uh, thanks to undertone effects for sponsoring this episode. And thank you to our executive producer, Martika Barra and Alex, our editor and the whole architects of imagination team. And uh, so great to see you, Mo. Thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you very much. It was good seeing you too, dude. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs>